God, that is good. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful after you take your mask off? I'm not saying take your mask off, but after you take your mask off, how good it is to breathe. It's like, wow, I so appreciate fresh air. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to have uh, you with us. Um, church has kind of changed, hasn't it? But you know, the, um, I was thinking about this this week, that the etymology of the word church means inner cave or inner sanctum, which I think is great because that's really what the science of mind is, is about. I believe it's about us cultivating that inner place of the sacred that's within us so that we know we carry that with us wherever we go. It's not that, that church is something that's outside or separate from us. It's that church, the inner cave, the altar, is within all of us. And so I'm going to continue um, what I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. I've been you know, rolling around with this idea of healing again, which you know, our teaching is a, healing, uh, is a healing philosophy. Ernest said that healing is a revealing of the spiritual truth. So the first thing I think about when I hear that is, all right, well, where is that spiritual truth? It, well, it's not that the spiritual truth is outside of us. Science of Mind says the spiritual truth is inside of us, waiting to be uncovered and discovered and recovered at, at, at any moment of, of our journey. Um, so we consider certain things curable, healable, and others maybe not so much. But here's what I come to when I really sit with this, that there is a healing presence in the universe. That same healing presence that's everywhere in the universe exists within each and every one of us right now. We on Earth are, we're always in the process of making progress, you know, which, which I think is great. That means that consciousness is evolving because we couldn't be making progress if consciousness were not evolving. So I remember when I, was, um, when I was very young as a child, there were some conditions, some diagnoses that people had that were absolutely taken as a death sentence. Um, my mother had a sister, this was Aunt Mary, and we all loved Aunt Mary. We were crazy about Aunt Mary. And Aunt Mary's story, what was interesting about her story is when she was very young, uh, the way I remember it being told to us is that there was an epidemic of rheumatic fever. So we're going back a long time. I don't think rheumatic fever has been around lately. But she had rheumatic fever, and as a result of the rheumatic fever, uh, as, as a very young child, she uh, became deaf and was also mute. So that was pretty unusual to have somebody deaf and mute um, within our family. And yet, even though she was extraordinarily challenged on the outer physical level, she was the most loving person any of us knew. She was just like this little heart chakra with little feet attached to it, you know? And wherever we went, it, it, was, it was amazing. Because wherever we went, uh, my sister and I talked about this recently, uh, or if there was a family gathering or some social thing, Aunt Mary would find a seat, and inevitably, all the children and animals would wind up around her. Like, they were just drawn to her because, I think, she was just this very safe, loving place. And so the dogs would all be around her feet and they'd fall asleep and she'd usually have like a baby or a, a child in each arm and they'd be falling asleep and you'd say, gee, do, do you need anything? Do you want anything? She, and she would indicate that I can't move, but I'm really happy. Can't move, covered with love. I'm really happy. So weren't we all surprised when Aunt Mary was diagnosed with breast cancer? And now 55 or so million years ago, <laughs> the treatment was not what it is now, right? Like so many things, consciousness has evolved. But I remember, particularly in my Aunt Mary's case, that the treatment that she had to undergo was really, really what we would consider today barbaric. And it was the most advanced they knew at the time. You know, 55 years ago, they did what they did, and, and the surgery was often drastic and radical, and, and we have made so much progress since then. Of course, at some point back then, this was the um, opportunity for Aunt Mary to, to make her transition, to step into the larger life. But today, thank God, because consciousness has a, continued to evolve, I like to look at it like this, that doctors are the vehicles for God. 
for God's wisdom, for God's intelligence, for God's right action. But the doctors are not God. And I will tell you, I came from a generation of people who really thought that doctors were God. Now, I love doctors because, like we say, I am sure that the doctors are God's instruments on earth. And as Ernest is very clear in our textbook, Ernest says, take the pill and take the prayer. And maybe, maybe, someday your consciousness will evolve to the point where you don't need the pill. All you need is the prayer. But he's really clear. Until your consciousness gets to that place, do both. You take the pill. God is working through this pill for my highest and greatest good. Chug. And I'm doing the prayer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to realize that there is no one and nothing in the universe that wishes us to be unwell. You know that notion, well, maybe God wants me to be sick or this must be the will of God. That's nonsense. It really is. And we've just got to stop it. It's superstition. It's garbage. I don't know how to say it any differently. It is not healthy, intelligent, principle-based thinking, right? God must want me to be sick. I'm sorry, but that's a lousy, puny, vengeful God. And that is not the God we have in the science of mind teaching. We have a God of infinite intelligence and wisdom and love. These are the primary qualities, we believe, of the infinite mind. And the infinite mind could never want, wish, or desire for us anything less than the greatness of itself. That God wants us to just express more of God. And what is God? God is love and life and health and beauty and abundance and creativity. So a current condition in our life, say a health issue, which we would also say in Science of Mind is an error condition, is foreign to the intelligent plan for our body. And we say, oh God, I'm sick, you know? Um, this, uh, well. When, when we say to God, oh, please, God, please, I'm so sick, make me well, I feel like what God says back is, well, it's not part of my plan. <laughs> Sorry you're sick, but it's really not part of my plan. So, so if sickness, if these physical challenges that we experience are not part of the will of God, and I really believe that God never, ever says, Let's see, I got to fill a quota today. I got to get some people sick on earth. Let's say, Mark, you be sick. And oh, you, you be sick, you be sick. Yeah, okay, that's it. Now we can. That is not the way it works, right? The one intelligence, you know, which built our bodies in the first place knows how to build right now whatever it is that we need so that we can be in complete and perfect health and wellness. You know, there has to be nothing in our mind which denies spiritual truth. This, this is a big part of our teaching. We keep ourselves, I think, in prison because we try to go forward while we're looking in the rearview mirror. So I don't know if you've ever taught anybody to drive, you know, your kids, your grandkids, or anything like that. But imagine, imagine trying to teach somebody to drive, but they only want to look in the rearview mirror, not out the great big windshield. Now think about it. The rearview mirror is only this big. But the windshield is this big. So that says to me we should be looking forward a lot more than we're looking back. But the problem is we look back. And in the looking back, we often take the past, the past experiences, and we drag them into our present and push them forward into our future. Looking backward, I think, keeps us in a prison of our own making. You know, yes, yes, the past is the past. And for all of us, I think the spiritually mature student looks at the past, takes the good, takes the love, takes the learning, whatever is of value, and all the other stuff, you know the other stuff, the story, the condition, the drama, the fighting, the he said, she said, they did, they did, all that. Let all of that go. Let all of that go. So we're, we're, we're taking the good, keeping what was valuable, and letting everything else just go. See, our faith is our consciousness turned to a spiritual reality. I think there is an emphasis on um, love and peace and brotherhood, it seems to me, in all of the ancient sacred books. You know, spiritual knowledge is, is always sort of blazing the trail. And so new discoveries it, uh, by the scientific world help substantiate you know, the postulants of spiritual healing. This is happening more and more now. Science is becoming more spiritual and church is becoming more scientific. Who would have thought, right? But for the infinite intelligence, you know, 
The infinite intelligence is a spiritual thinker operating scientifically in the universe that we, in, we are in. So let's consider what we might call hard cases. We've all had them in our life, and certainly people we know have had difficult situations, what we might term difficult situations for healing, the hard cases, right? The, the tough situations to heal. Let's be clear, though, for us, they may be difficult, but they're not difficult for God. There is no big or small in the mind of God. Whether we have a splinter that needs to come out in healing on our little finger, or there's some big, major condition, remember, the infinite intelligence is not the problem. That's so humbling, isn't it? You know, it's like, okay, it, this is not about God. Nothing is. With God, all things are possible. But we have to know, yes, with God, all things are possible. The difference lies in the resources which each of us bring to bear on the condition. You know, we have all seen at some time, uh, probably, uh, maybe in a movie, but, but I don't think it's difficult to see this in real life, like a dog that's been tied to a tree, which I hate to begin with, but that's another story. Dog tied to a tree, and the dog runs around the tree so that the dog is actually uh, restricted. You know, he doesn't have any rope left, you know, and, and so he looks like he's really bound, uh, held down. So think about that, and then think about this, that a greater intelligence could take and lead the dog back around the tree the other way, and free him. So to the dog, I was thinking, gee, that might really seem like a miracle, right? Like, oh my god, I could barely move, and now I have all this space. I'm free again. But it was merely a higher application of the law. The dog actually used the law to bind himself, and we used the law to free him. So the same law that brings illness will heal us if the first step is to start reversing our thought. So to me, this means there are no incurable conditions, only incurable ways of approaching them, only incurable ways of, like, of thinking. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the condition is not healable. It's that up until now, I have been unwilling to heal what's been operating in here. So I know that for a lot of people, even saying the word God is kind of a, a buzzword. It's like Jesus or Christ or Jesus Christ. But I don't think the problem is with the word. See, and I don't think that God cares what you call God. I really don't. I think God is big enough that God has like transcended the human ego. And, you know, so I think that the infinite doesn't really care what we call the infinite. But I, um, I don't think the problem is with the words, but with the meaning that we have ascribed to the words. This is one of the things I've loved about Ernest, that, that when Ernest formulated the science of mind teaching, what he did was that he, he opened up the name of God. So yes, it's God, but it's also first cause, it's infinite intelligence, um, it's the father-mother principle. He, he said, yeah, it's God, but it's, it's so much bigger than that. And what happened was that people who had turned away from church thought, hmm, I could take a look at this. If it's not just a guy in the sky with a book keeping track, and honestly, that's very much what I was brought up with. So to find science of mind and, and new thought teachings was absolutely the most freeing, liberating revelation I could imagine. You know, the same laws that, that bring illness will heal us if we would start by reversing our thought. So no incurable conditions, only incurable thinking. And, and I think that if I have an association um, with a particular spiritual term like God, then I have to know that the problem isn't the word God. The problem is, how would I say it? It's my baggage. You know, and I admit, when I came into the science of mind, I had lots of baggage about spiritual, religious things. I probably still do, but like, I think I am making a little bit of progress. So, I, so, so God is a term we use, I think, to express what many people instinctively feel exists. Like, I have always believed that there was God, that there was something, you know, from the time I was little. I remember uh, being young, and we had enormous woods near our house, 
and uh, weird kid that I was, I used to bicycle to the woods and I'd lay my bike down where nobody you know, driving by might see it, and I'd walk into the woods, and back east these were all pine forests, you know? And so a pine forest has this great, great smell. And when you walk on years and years of pine needles, you kinda, it's kinda spongy, you kinda sink, you know, when you're walking in that kind of forest. And as a kid, what I like to do is I like to lay down on the pine needles and look up through the pine trees and see the sky and the clouds. And somehow to me, in my young mind, this was incredibly spiritual. And it wouldn't be until much later that I was actually able to find a place for, for that. You know, but, but going out into the woods as a young kid and smelling that pine and walking on the mushy ground and looking up through the trees, I somehow felt connected to something greater that I didn't feel connected to other ways, you know? So, so it's interesting to me how nature for so many people is where um, we feel connected, you know, maybe at the beach or watching a sunset or, I don't know, uh, playing with a dog, you know, that it seems that a lot of people's experience of a higher power, um, that those, those things are revealed in nature. But the, you know, the intelligence that built the universe is the same intelligence that built us, and it knows how to rebuild any part that we call for in healing. Uh, when, when certain conditions are met. So I've been thinking about what are the conditions I need to meet so that my consciousness is really available to healing. And the things that I think of, first of all, I have to change my thinking and keep it changed. And that's a job that I have to do a thousand, a hundred thousand times a day, to change my thinking and keep it changed. I think that gratitude is so important, and, it's, and gratitude before receiving is a demonstration of incredible faith. When we are grateful for a healing before the healing has happened, that's faith. And I think that's really big faith, and I think that's significant. I think that we have to forgive everyone and everything. If we really want to be healed, do you really want to go down the drain just because you are unwilling to forgive someone for something that happened way back when? Which really, when you think about it, 10 minutes after it happened probably didn't matter that, that much in most cases. You know that I think we have to be willing to, um, to change our thinking, to practice great, tremendous gratitude, to forgive. Yes, absolutely to love. To love, 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 love. You know, there is no mystical consciousness without love. There really is no forward movement. I think that we have to say, if I were healed, how would that feel? How would I be? What would my life be like if this healing that I am so desirous of had taken place? And then have a few minutes where we close our eyes and imagine that. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm telling people, oh yeah, I don't have that problem anymore. And I imagine my doctor saying to me, you are my star patient. I want you to meet all my other patients and tell them what you done, you've done. And, and, and imagine those things because I think that kind of visualization makes the healing more and more real to us. You know, our attitude is so important. I mean, when have we ever said, hey, let's go out. Maybe we can meet some people with a lousy attitude. We don't say that. And I think the universe responds to us the same way, that we have to have a good, life-affirming attitude. And of course, you know, that starts with good talk, uh, good words, good deeds, all of that, all of that. You know, things may be um, seemingly incurable, from a standpoint of partial knowledge. But remember that the principle we are working with is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. So come back to God within me is all-powerful. You know, uh, before, all, before the all-powerful, the condition that we are faced with, pretty small, pretty insignificant. You know, but as long as the fear of the condition outweighs the knowledge of the power, there's not going to be any healing. I'll say that again. As long as the fear of the condition outweighs the knowledge of the power that we are working with, this power and presence of God within us, there's not going to be a healing. But as soon as the knowledge of the power outweighs the fear of the condition, healing can happen. You know, either God is present at every point in time and space, or not. 
Now, I like the idea that God, the infinite intelligence and love of the universe, is present at every point in time and space. So right where the trouble seems to be, God is, as the infinite healing omnipresence. So we want to say, how do I tie this all together? I think the bottom line is we want to say, thank you, God, thank you, life, thank you, spirit, thank you, truth, a lot more than Oh, please, God. Please, God, do this. Please, God, do that. Please, God, do this. Because, you know, think about it. All those please, gods, that has not been tremendously successful for us as metaphysical spiritual students. But thank you, God, comes from another direction. And again, to give thanks in advance of having a healing, I think, is, is the highest form of prayer. To give thanks before the healing is actually um, evidenced on earth. Um, so thank you a lot more than please. Um, because I think when we're thankful before the answer comes, what we're saying is the work has already been done. That's it. You know, the work has already been done. Uh, that this is, this is the highest form of faith. So um, we continue on our journey of healing. And you know, um, it was Emma Curtis Hopkins who said, the principles that you use to heal your body are the same principles you use to heal a relationship or heal your finances or anything else. And so let's set about using those principles right now. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward for a moment, recognizing that, yes, we are surrounded, we are filled with God's infinite, loving, intelligent spirit. And this spirit that is the truth about each and every one of us responds to our creative, intelligent thinking. So I claim for each and every one of us here and now that we have everything within us, everything we need to have perfect healing in our life. That we create the perfect conditions where healing naturally comes forth. We are loving, we are grateful, we are forgiving. All of these things are part of the very fabric of our being, and the environment is right and ripe for perfect healing. There is nothing in the universe that wishes us to be ill. And so I claim for each and every one of us today that there is raising up. With minds and hearts that are open, we receive the impress of the divine, and I know that impress is always for greater love and greater life. So we include in our prayer our family members and friends, parents, children, grandchildren, all of those we love and hold near and dear. And we remind ourselves that the perfect presence of an infinite principle is right where they are, and all is well. We let our prayer be a blessing energy in the consciousness of all humanity. Our prayer moves out from us, touching all people everywhere, adding only light and love to the earth. And of course, we bless our church as we bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams and all paths to God. And again, I'm certain that we are blessed by being together in consciousness today. And so it is with an open, gracious, full heart that I say, thank you, God, this is the truth. I release this word, and so it is. Amen.